Hey everybody, this is Dr. Sullivan back with you for another Eye Care for Your Brain lecture. And today is a follow-up from last week. Last week we talked all about this brain fitness industry and what does that mean? Those are the supplements that are marketed to you to improve your brain health, improve memory, improve cognitive function. These are the brain games create a stronger brain, uh, power yourself into a powerful and disease resistant brain. But what you now know after listening to my last lecture is that unfortunately, this is a eight to $10 billion industry that has very little scientific merit and relies on a lot of marketing ploys and tactics to basically take folks money time and hope and that is a big motivator for me to be here with you today because there are so many genuinely helpful things that brain scientists know really work for brain health but we're just not talking about them enough so one of the concepts that this whole brain fitness industry is really banking on is something called cognitive reserve and i want you to understand it so that way you can exploit this scientific concept for all that it's worth to get the very best genuine brain health that you can get. So I thought what might be helpful to start off tonight is just a very quick recap of some of the things that we talked about last time. What we did is after we debunked a lot of these products, we talked about the two risk factors for less than optimal brain health and we broke them down into modifiable risk factors, meaning these are something you can do something about. We talked about non-modifiable risk factors and these are things you can't do anything about. And the list for the non-modifiable is very, very small. These are things like age, and things like specific genetic mutations. Those are really the only two things that could influence your chance of getting dementia that you really have no control about. The vast majority of dementias are related to things called modifiable risk factors. And what these are, are things that happen in our environment, both internally and externally, that can truly influence the likelihood of you developing a neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's disease all the different types of dementia. And these are the things that we need to be talking about. So we went through the list last time, but just to remind you, these are things like cardiovascular diseases, like high blood pressure, type two diabetes, high cholesterol, untreated sleep apnea, multiple head injuries, untreated hearing and vision loss, polypharmacy, which is taking more than five or six prescription medications, Delirium, which is classified as hospital-based confusion, often happens in the context of an infection, like a urinary tract infection. Too much alcohol, smoking, not enough exercise, poor diet, social isolation, depression, and low mental stimulation. So within the risk factors, you do everything you can, and that's a big part of why I'm here talking to you in this program, of how to realistically, from a science-based perspective, minimize these risk factors. But that's not the end of the story. We have to talk about this other side, which is cognitive reserve. So the magic formula that brain scientists know, it's really as simple as this, is modifying, reducing your risk factors and increasing this thing we call cognitive reserve, which is kind of like your buffer against the modifiable risk factor. So I want to tell you, how is it that this concept came into being? What is the support for it? And how can you benefit from this information? So this was a concept um, that has really been accepted in the neuroscience community as valid. And most, uh, if not all, brain scientists, neuropsychologists would tell you that this is a concept that we really believe in. There's been a lot of scientific evidence for it. And it really makes just good theoretical sense. So the idea here is that it is a type of reserve, whether it is structural brain related reserve or strategy based reserve, and we're gonna get into all that tonight, uh, against brain damage that stems from the repeated observation in the scientific literature that there is not a direct relationship between the degree of structural changes that happen in the brain due to all types of brain pathology, and mostly what's been studied is dementia, 
But we're going to talk a little bit tonight about how stroke and Parkinson's disease factor into this too. But then the clinical manifestation from the damage on the other hand. So this is why we cannot over rely on or over interpret brain scans, neuroimages. So many people come to see me as a neuropsychologist and say, you know, my MRI, uh, I, I was told that it was completely normal for age. You know, why are we here? And I have to help people understand that is the structure of your brain. What I do as a neuropsychologist is assess the function of your brain and how your brain is uh, the health of your brain within the context of yourself because we never want to reduce ourselves down to these biological systems. And you know that's one of my strong values as a doctor and in this I Care For Your Brain program is that brain health can't just be about the brain, right? We have to talk about ourselves and our psychology and our social nature. There's so much more to brain health than just this three pound organ that sits between our ears. So. The doctor that came up with this concept, his name is Dr. Stern, and he is at New York University. And he was involved with a series of autopsy studies a couple decades ago in which people, while they were alive, were a part of a clinical trial, so a big research study. And these were people that went through a lot of different memory tests, and when they passed away, they donated their brain to the research project. And during the autopsy, they looked at their brains under a microscope and they determined who had what we call pathological Alzheimer's disease, meaning in their brain they had the plaques and the tangles associated with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's and who actually exhibited these symptoms during life, okay? And the shocking finding was that 25% in people, so one in four, met criteria for a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease on autopsy but did not show the symptoms in life and this was a life career changing insight for Dr. Stern because that meant that there was not a one-to-one -one relationship between the structure of the brain and the function of the brain. And so he needed to explain this finding. And this is the concept of cognitive reserve. And basically what he has taught us is that there are a certain set of circumstances that in essence build a stronger brain. And we do this in two different ways. There's strength in more connections between brain cells. So we've talked about this before. You've got these two brain cells here. And the way brain cells really communicate is through branches or dendrites. And they get together and they exchange information and it goes back and forth. And that is, in essence, cognition. That's how our brain works, right? So the stronger the brain cells, his idea is that the more disease it's going to take to break down those strong bonds. So in that sense, it's a very structural strength. So that's brain reserve. Cognitive reserve, another part of it, is being able to then compensate better for age and disease related changes. So let me just explain that a little bit more. So not only do we have resistance to disease in the brain at a cellular level because we literally have a stronger bond, right? So the bricks that are building the house are uh, heavier and they've been put on with stronger cement and foundation so they can withstand wind a little bit more. But we also then have stronger brain networks so that if there's a problem over here, another grouping of brain cells can basically figure out behind the scenes without our knowledge how to compensate. So the big question, of course, is what are these sets of circumstances that lead to this stronger brain? Well, what he taught us is that it depends heavily, but not exclusively, on early life. And this is key because we want to know this for our kids, our grandkids. The idea here is the younger you are when you start to do some of these things, I'm going to teach you tonight, the better. But a key, key, key finding is that it's truly never too late and we need to know what these rules are that dictate cognitive reserve so you know what to do to build a healthier brain now, even if you're listening to me and you are 100 years old. So what he says is that our early education, the complexity of the jobs that we've had throughout our lives, our socioeconomic status, and the complexity of our social activities, our hobbies, our interests, 
are what together build a stronger brain. So the key things that I want you to hear from that are that brain health is not one thing. And this goes back to one of my six problems with the brain fitness industry. The brain is much too complex to benefit from one simple pill or one brain game. True brain health is always going to be multifactorial. It simply cannot happen in a one-off approach. You have got to come at it from different angles. And this is where people can sometimes get it wrong because they think, oh, I just need to exercise my brain. We treat the brain like a muscle, right? Remember I talked to you about how we used to think of aerobics and now we kind of treat the brain like it and that's something called neurobics. That's just not realistic in terms of brain health. We have to be very um, collaborative and multidisciplinary in our approach to brain health. So um, when you look at the literature on cognitive reserve, what you see is that over the last 10 to 20 years, there's been a lot written about it. And again, that's why we think there's so much scientific support for it. So what I wanted to do, because I know so many of you are out here listening because you have focal things going on in your brain. So what I mean by that is you might not have a whole brain problem. You might have a focal brain problem, a part of the brain problem. So this would be something like a stroke, something like essential tremor, something like Parkinson's disease, traumatic brain injury. Something has happened to a specific part of your brain. So I wanted to look at that literature over the weekend so I could teach you about that. And there is something interesting there. So most of the research has been done on whole brain issues. So neurodegenerative dementias like Alzheimer's disease. So remember I said Dr. Stern's work, the clinical condition in which he made this finding was Alzheimer's. So a lot of studies have looked at dementia. When you start to look at things like stroke and traumatic brain injury, what you find is that cognitive reserve actually becomes less influential. And the theory there is that it probably takes a very long time for compensatory strategies to kick in. So when something is sudden, like a stroke is very sudden, a traumatic brain injury is very sudden, the brain doesn't have enough time to develop ways to compensate. Things like Alzheimer's disease have actually been happening in the brain for decades. We think now probably 30 or 40 years before the symptoms are starting to be expressed. That gives a smart brain a very long time to figure out, okay, I'm having a little bit of trouble here. How am I gonna activate these other brain networks so they can come in and help compensate? When something in the brain changes like that overnight, you just don't have a leg up because you haven't developed strategies to compensate for the problem. So cognitive reserve, what we really think when it really matters is in long-term brain issues, and only up to a certain point. So it's really an early stage neurodegenerative contributor. So the idea is that people, research studies have suggested that people who have higher education can withstand more of those plaques and tangles in the brain that cause Alzheimer's disease before they start to show the symptoms because their brain is stronger. Again, they can compensate. If you have lower education, the idea is that maybe a smaller amount of the plaques and tangles in your brain will be there before you can start to show the symptoms. Now, there's one problem with that, which is you and I both know there are plenty of people who do not have high levels of formal education, but that are smart as a whip, that can uh, fix a motor way better than most of us, that um, can do um, mechanical things that can take apart appliances and put them back together. And unfortunately, they are not captured in these studies because they're just looking at years of education. So high school, a bachelor's degree, a master's and a doctorate. That's how most of the research has been set up. So I don't want anyone listening to think that somehow if someone you know has Alzheimer's disease, it's because they weren't smart enough or they didn't uh, go to school long enough. It, it's not quite as simple as that, but I, I do want you to kind of understand the essence of the research. 
So there was a um, study in 2018, just a couple months ago, in the Journal of Neural Transmission that looked at Parkinson's disease as it relates to cognitive reserve. And I wanted to just briefly tell you about that because I know I have a lot of folks out there with PD who are listening. So in this study, they looked at people at year one and then at year five. And basically um, what they were looking at is that Parkinson's disease is progressive, unfortunately. And what happens is most people start off with a unilateral tremor, which is in one hand or foot, one side of the body. And over time, more of their body, more of their brain gets impaired. And so most people go from having a tremor on one side to having trouble with their posture and something called um, postural instability gait difficulty. So what they looked at were the rate of conversion from people going from a one-sided tremor in the hand to having more of these postural instability problems. And what they found after five years was that 38% of the people were still in the tremor only phase and all of them had transitioned over five years to having more problems with their overall gait. But what they found was that there were many more people who stayed in just the tremor predominant phase that had what we call increased cognitive reserves. So more years of education and on cognitive testing, they did better at baseline. So the idea here is that not only is it protective in terms of cognitive strategies, might it also have a whole brain effect to be compensatory for movement disorders. So that's a whole, I mean, that literally just came out a few months ago. So that's research for us to make sure that we stay on top of. So remember, a very important thing is that that there is no age limit for adding to your cognitive reserve. You can kind of think of it like a brain bank. So the very important question is, yeah, okay, I'm convinced. How do I do that? So there was a research study that also came out um, within this last year called the Tasmanian Healthy Brain Project. And what they did is they took older adults and they, over the course of a year, this was uh, about 359 older adults, um, and they basically sent them to college and they tested them over uh, the course of the year and then after. And they compared them to 100 healthy controls who basically did nothing. And what they found was the folks that went back to college had significantly higher language processing. So they were able to find their words quicker. And the idea is that because of the cognitive stimulation that they got from taking these college courses, their brain was better able to retrieve information quickly. And that is one of the number one complaints of a normally aging person is I cannot come up with my words as fast as I used to, especially someone's name. So I love that research study because that's a big part of what I do when I go out and do my talks is not only are you learning very interesting things that I think are going to help you by my direct recommendations, simply the process of learning and being in a social group in a one to two to 300 person lecture, that is a cognitive stimulating activity. That is a brain game and that is a huge message that is very important to me is you don't need to be paying for a subscription for brain games. The truth is conversation is a brain game. Uh, having lunch with someone, the back and forth of remembering and laughing and enjoying each other is a cognitively stimulating activity, okay? So there's really no need to pay. I think that's a very big uh, disservice that we think that people should be paying for brain games. The truth is life is a brain game. We just need to know what to do. So I wanted to leave you by talking about three rules of cognitive reserve. And this is related to that neuroplasticity concept. They're very interchangeable. So what is it that I can be doing to make the best reserves in this brain bank possible? Where the first thing is something I've already told you. The earlier is better, but it's truly never too late. So please don't believe that you can't treat, uh, teach old dogs new tricks things. That's just not true and it's kind of mean. So I want you to know it's really never too late. The things that you need to do are pick an activity that is based in something you've done for a long time, but I want you to find a new angle. So novelty is one of the things that is the most challenging for the brain. So let's imagine you've played piano for many years. I would love for you to revisit the piano, get familiar with it again, 
but possibly teach yourself a new tune. It doesn't have to be that complicated. It doesn't have to be a big, um, difficult, complex song. It just has to be something new that you have to try over and over and over again to learn. And you eventually end up at a point of mastering it. You actually can do the new task. So the keys there are repetition, doing, building on the familiar, right? Making it new and complex. Okay. If you do those things, you, if you understand that you can apply that to anything, you can apply that to golf. You can apply that to reading. You can apply that to relationships. You can imply, apply that to things that you just imagine in your mind, creative visualizations. Sometimes, unfortunately, because of medical issues, sometimes people are not able to get up and be mobile in a way that they would like. You always have your creativity. You always have to remember that you can use your mind to make your brain stronger. You just needed to know what those tools were. So I hope that this was helpful to you. What I'm going to be talking about next week is kind of an extension of this, which is how is it that we can move more towards patient-centered brain health care? And what I mean by that is how is it that we can get this information to more and more people? Because I know for a fact that you are out there wanting to know this information. You don't want the shortcuts. You don't want the supplements. I think that they're so popular because we haven't given a better alternative to people, which is science-based knowledge about the brain. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what are those barriers towards changing this culture of the brain fitness industry. And I'm gonna challenge you to ask you how is it that you can do your part because I think the truth is is anytime we go to the doctor and we're not getting what it is we want we're not feeling satisfied we're not getting good enough information and we don't say something we're becoming part of the problem and I want to empower you with appropriate respectful self-advocacy to go in there and request information that is relative to you and your personal brain injury um, I'm amazed at how many people don't really understand where they had their stroke, for example, how Parkinson's affects something like mood or cognition, uh, where essential tremor is happening in their brain. We need to be more respectful as doctors in our communication with our patients about their brain. We can never forget it's their brain. They're the one experiencing it. We have to be collaborative. We have expertise as doctors, but we can never forget that the patient has the most expertise in the room. So if you believe in that model, I need you with me so we can have a revolution here and get to better care. So if you join me next Wednesday at six o'clock, I'm going to be talking about that in detail. Thank you guys so much for listening to me. I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.